What's up, guys? It's Chris from DMGH Podcast. Today, we will be talking to Amanda Neely, a financial advisor and financial genius. I'm really excited to talk to her today, and I hope you guys get something out of this. Let's go. Three, two, one, let's go. Welcome to Don't Mind the Golden Handcuffs Podcast, or DMGH Podcast. A place for future and present attorneys or any young professional to find the motivation they need to further their minds, careers, and financial success. It's hard to make it out there when you came from nothing. We want to provide you with some help with that. Of course, a one-person team couldn't accomplish this. DMGH Podcast experienced guests will guide us on this road to career and financial success. First, let's take this law thing one step. Amanda, thank you for joining us today. Host, hey, thanks for uh, having me. It's great to be here. It's really exciting. Uh, I think that my audience could really benefit from talking to a person such as yourself. Hey, I'm, I'm glad to uh, hopefully be of help to some people out there. Um, I, I seek to really work alongside people, be an educator, and the more opportunities I get to share what I've learned with other people, um, the better. So thanks for inviting me. Our pleasure. So why don't we get started? Tell me about yourself. Yeah. So my name is Amanda and uh, currently I uh, am a mom. I have an almost 11 month old. I can't believe he's going to be one really (laughs) soon. Um, And I I work as a financial professional, um, helping people create financial strategies for the short term, the medium term, and the long term. Make sure they're looking at all of those in particular mm-hmm. um, and, and creating a strategy for each. I'm a big fan of the financial independence and financial freedom um, movement. And I, I also live simply and love the the flexibility and the freedom I have, especially as a mom to be able to spend time with my son and still be an entrepreneur and a business person as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been quite a journey to get here, but that's that's kind of me in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, nice. So my immediate circle is usually all investors or law students, and I kind of have come to, to realize that everyone has their own investment philosophy. Um, I've said before that if you get 10 investors in one room, they will all disagree on probably like 20% of everything. Um, so why don't you go ahead and tell, uh, the listeners your investment philosophy or a little summary of it? Yeah. So I actually have a podcast called grandma's wealth wisdom and my philosophy just with finances in general really goes back to grandma and how she, she lived and did her, you know, used her finances and, you know, really simple, sustainable doing things like, um, growing your own food, canning your own vegetables, you know, things Mm -hmm. like that. And that really influences what I do with my money. Um, A couple really important things uh, is to only invest money you can afford to lose and have a strong foundation of saving first. Mm -hmm. And I I really learned that from that greatest generation, you know, sort of the people that grew up during the depression, you know, as I, you know, graduated college shortly before the recession started, um, I've had to, you know, come back to those same kind of ways of living. And that really influences what I do with my money from that point too, which, um, for me, I think there's a really clear distinction between investing and saving. And I, I try to make sure I'm, I'm doing both. Yeah, definitely. I agree. I think that saving money isn't a way investing money because you would have probably lost that money if you weren't saving it. Uh, right. And so a little bit about myself, a quick little thing is that um, I'm huge on what you just said. Uh, I started investing by basically not eating out, cooking my own food, uh, saving as much money as I can. With that money, I put it into um, stocks after learning about stocks and reading endless amounts of books about stocks. Um, and then after that, I got into real estate investing and I purchased some um, 14 homes in during my second year of law school. Um, but what you said is, is absolutely true where, um, you have to be willing, you should only invest what you're willing to lose. Um, cause then that, I feel like that helps also take away the emotion aspect out of investing. If you're willing to lose the money, you won't be as emotional when the markets fluctuate. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of what, what I learned as well, as well. But I think what you just said is is definitely the uh, foundation of, of successful investing. 
Yeah. And a big thing that's different now from when, you know, grandma was our age is that when we, so when I talk about savings, you know, people might also think of like savings accounts, CDs, you know, money markets, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And we have super low interest rates in those right now. So it's hard to think about saving in those places. Um, And then, um, so a lot of people jump to investing, you know, mutual funds, ETFs, or real estate investing. And I think there's some, um, middle ground to be found there in ways to have that emergency fund or, you know, things like that set up so that when, if there is an emergency, you don't have to sell your stocks or you don't have to sell your, your real estate investments or whatever. So finding that right mix of having things that are going to, you know, be the risky side, but also things that are going to be there when you need them as well. Which is one reason why I kind of I like stocks and I like real estate. With stocks, I like it because it's not the most. It's simple, but it's also annoying to to sell your stocks and then transfer to your bank account. So a lot of times I tell people, hey, if you have only two hundred dollars, a hundred dollars, investing in stocks might just be a great way to save money because in in, in a way you're kind of um, putting it far away from yourself, so you're not mm-hmm. tempted to use it. But of course, that varies for every person as well. Right. Yeah. And their risk tolerance and those kind of things too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next one's kind of like a whopper. So um, uh, I apologize if it catches you off guard, but what is the most important financial lesson you have ever learned throughout your lifetime? Yeah, there's been so many. Um, so my, my father was actually part of the greatest generation. He was pretty old when I was born. And I learned a lot about like saving and living, you know, within your means. And, um, he was, he was, a uh, he did a lot of work with his hands. He actually took our family home and totally remodeled it and sold it, sold it for double what he purchased it for, wow. um, over the 13 years that we lived there as a family. And so I learned a lot from him about how much you can do with, so with very little. Um, I, when I was born, my parents were in public assistance. My mom went back to college in her thirties in order to, to get a good job and provide for our family. And yet I didn't know that, you know, until I was mm-hmm. older, I, I thought we were, you know, normal average. Um, and it really was because my dad put his, his muscle, you know, yeah. behind things. And he figured out ways to make a little become a lot, yeah. you know, just for us as a family. And uh, that's really influenced my entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, and how, like how I live my life, just if I have, you know, a little bit, how can I take that and make it a lot more? Yeah. And I think that goes, you know, with investing, but also, um, really as if people are starting their own businesses, you know, you have to be thinking in those kind of ways too. So yeah. it's, it's influenced like my entire life, not just what I do with my money. Yeah. And was your dad very frugal when, when you're growing up due to uh, him living through a really challenging part in America? Yeah. Um, he, he, um, you could say he was, you know, cheap. He, he didn't spend a lot of money, but he, like he, he cooked, you know, fresh food and, yeah. you know, we ate at home rather than going out and, yeah. you know, things like that, um, that, that just were the way of life, you know, and maybe I'm actually in better health because we yeah. were <laughs> eating fast food all the time or whatever. Yeah. It's the same for my father. My parents immigrated from Brazil. Uh, so mm-hmm. my dad got here. He, they didn't have anything. They didn't have any money in their pocket. So for them, um, being frugal was kind of the only way to save money, especially since they didn't have the financial knowledge to uh, invest in different in different things. Um, but it's it's pretty amazing how much you could actually save by not eating out or not going to the movie theater every every day, or even like just finding coupons and and deals. I feel like yeah, yeah. Uh, are you gonna say something? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next one would be. How would you motivate someone who has n- has never saved money or is not experienced in investing to invest in their financial health or- and financial f- uh, future? Yeah, this is a big thing that I think about. I'm a planner. I love, you know, making strategies and thinking through things, but not everybody is like that. And so that I think a, a couple of things. One is finding someone to do that with you and help you see what could happen if you save, you know, if you took that first step, what's where could that lead you down, you know, in years from now um, and being able to see that full picture but then also not getting lost in the full picture and be seeing what that first step is and knowing, you know, if it's a dollar a week or if it's, you know, a 10, a, you know, a 10%, you know, be, go, you know, leaving your 
bank account and going somewhere where you can't touch it, you know, some kind of strategy like that. Um, and then, you know, it's really hard, you know, especially kind of in the 21st century where we have the, these ideas of you, YOLO, you only live once and, yeah. um, you know, FOMO, the fear of missing out and yeah. to really like choose that alternate, you know, kind of get into the joy of missing out and yeah. knowing, you know, that, yeah, you only live once, but when you're 70, you don't want to have to be still working like you exactly. did when you're 30, you know? Yeah. And so you, you have to find that, you have to find the motivation and you have to be thinking about your future self as yourself, yeah. um, not as like another person, which is psychologically kind of hard to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. But um, that that can help then when you're first starting out and you see that longer picture, you've spent some time thinking about 40 years from now or whatever it is, um, that can then help you take that right first step forward and know what that right step first step is. Yeah. So what would you tell someone that's so young, uh, like 25, 24, 21, that isn't really worried about retirement because they think that uh, like wherever they they work, their their job will take care of them and of their future. Right. Yeah. So, and I see you smile the, there too when I said is, that because that's such a foreign yeah. concept. Like, like that age is basically over where your job just takes care of you for your whole life. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that. That. Um. You know, there there are still golden handcuffs out there and yeah. companies that you know get people in there and ha t try to take care of them financially so that they won't leave. Right? Yeah. Um. But that age is coming to an end. Um. And it really we can't you know, count on social security or our employers taking care of us. We have to take our future into our own hands and mm -hmm. increasingly more and more. I, I think there's statistics out there of, you know, the age of even employment is going away and more and more independent contractors and, um, you know, and you have to have that entrepreneurial spirit. You have to figure out like, are, do you want to start your own 401k or IRA? Do you want to look at alternate ways to, to grow your wealth and take care of yourself? And it, the earlier you think about that, the, the longer you have, you know, like you get the compound interest in your favor. Yeah. You, um, you know, if you are going into real estate, you're, you have longer to pay off the, the loans that you have on those homes through the rental that's coming in so that the sooner you have that done, the more that passive income is going to be yours yeah. and not partially going to the bank or, uh, whoever. So, um, the, it, it's actually even better to get started early. You know, I know people that started buying, real estate in when they were teenagers and yeah. they have hundreds of units now yeah. and they're, you know, they're in their thirties and that they're, they're, they're feeling really good about it. You know, yeah. it's not something you have to wait uh, to do. And the sooner you get started, the better it yeah. can be for you. And that's the thing, too, is I have people tell me, oh, my God, you have so many properties in your 26. And I'm like, that is nowhere near where other people I've seen have. My mentor met a 21-year-old, uh, 23-year-old, uh, and they tutored for like five years straight, made a, a way more money than I've seen anyone of that age make. And they, they their first properties uh, package they invested in was over a million dollars, and he paid it in cash. And I was like, wow, <laughs> like I'm nothing compared to that. So when people think you're too young to get into these things, it's like... Like it blows my mind. Yep. Yep. For sure. Um, so can you explain a little bit about compound growth? Just because that is what launched me, what uh, motivated me into invest, uh, to invest. Because when I learned about it, I was like, whoa, like if I start investing early, it should be a breeze by the time I'm 70. Yeah. So compound growth is where, you know, you're, you make money on your initial investment and then that's put back in and then that money that you made compounds and grows and continues to build on top of itself so then a dollar can become a, a lot more over mm -hmm. time it's been called the the eighth wonder of the world um you know because it just it's amazing what happens um there's been some really cool people i think it was benjamin franklin that knew a, yeah. the the power of compound growth and you know gave those gifts to his favorite cities and but said you can't touch it for a long time and now that those the that philanthropy is you know yeah. magnifying um but within our lifetimes we can even see a lot more of that but there's certain things that also eat away at the compound growth that we have to be careful of too um you know like fees to money managers um, that eats away at your compound growth yeah. um any taxes that you have to pay if it's not something that's not tax deferred can eat away at your compound growth um or maybe it's compounding over here but then you're detracting uh, from somewhere else 
Yeah. 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 So, um, and then even with real estate, like we've always believed that the price of or the, the value of our homes is always going to go up. Mm-hmm. But we learned <laughs> within the past 20 years, that's not always the case. So yeah. you're not, you're not, you can, it can be hard to know if you're getting compound growth for real. Yeah. And you have to be really careful and look for some, you know, is going to be there has some guarantees and some security behind it. Yeah. That's uh, I find that issue a lot in mutual funds where the fees just become so tremendous that when you look at the actual profit you're making, it's lower to, it's closer to like two or 3% compared to the 10% or 9% they're advertising. Right. And if you just look at the stock market with the volatility mm-hmm. that destroys compound growth, even before fees or taxes or anything, yeah. if the, you know, every year the market goes down by 10% at some point on yeah. some day. And yeah. oftentimes at least once a, a month, you know, it's it, that yeah. volatility can be happening. So did, do you really want that to be happening and destroying your compound growth too? Yeah. And that's something that compound growth eventually turns into compound motivation because you may not be that motivated the first year you invest. But once you see the compound coming in and working, you become so motivated to just, you know, how else could I add to this? How else could I save money? How else could I add $100 here since I now know that that will turn into $1,000 in, in whatever time period that will be? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so another question I wanted to ask was just because I have a lot of friends and colleagues that always have ideas for amazing businesses. Just in the last month, I've uh, had like three or four friends call me because uh, they saw me starting the podcast and they want information on how they could start their own businesses. I know like how to build an LLC. Um, and the biggest thing I find is that they, although they have amazing ideas that are, are truly, it, it, it surprises me with the ideas that come, that, that come out of their brains, but they always are too fearful to start it. Um, and they always find an excuse to not start it, whether it's, oh, it's not a right time now i'm gonna wait until you know i i graduate or wait until i'm four years out you know practicing law so what would you tell these people that are just stuck in that position because that is to me the worst position to be in is is scared right and um the yeah you do have to take action at some point right and you have to find an action that will help you start to overcome that fear so for just i can i uh, can share from my personal experience. So my husband and I came up with this idea to start a coffee shop that was, you know, local and um, also was doing good for coffee farmers in places like Brazil. And um, we we just had this idea and we were still, you know, working in our corporate jobs, you know, doing all that kind of thing. But we started at least educating ourselves, researching, talking to coffee shop owners. We did one year for our vacation. We went to Seattle and just visited a bunch of places and talked with as many owners as we could and wrote our business plan. And then when, because we were in that place where we were learning, we were planning, we were figuring things out. Then when doors started to open and opportunities started coming our way, we were ready to take advantage of them. And we were less fearful because we knew like a a better idea of what we were looking for. So when a door would open, we could say, well, yeah, that's the right door, (laughs) you know? Um, And we weren't as afraid, like, well, should we go through that door? Should we not go through that door? And so that's, that's probably the biggest thing is to figure out what you want to do and start learning about how to do it and making plans of how you would do it, talking to people, networking, those kind of things so that when an opportunity comes, you're ready to take it. Yeah, definitely. I see a lot on social media now, uh, certain, um, advertisers act as if they invented all these investment tools when they've been around for, if not a decade from way more than decade, like real estate has been here forever. Uh, right. so if you, there's a lot of books out there too, they should read about, but I definitely agree. I think that a uh, way to destroy fear is knowledge. You know, and yep. if you read enough books, if you talk to enough people, if you find a mentor, eventually, although you'll never feel 100% safe, like I didn't feel uh, 100% safe buying any of my properties or investing in stocks, but it gives you a certain amount of uh, confidence. Uh, but I think that's amazing yeah. finding mentors as well. Uh, did you have a mentor when you started, when you started your financial path? Yeah, absolutely. I've had several <laughs> um, and uh, they've been really great. Um, one of the best things that uh, when I was leaving my corporate job, one of my bosses told me before I left, if this entrepreneurial thing doesn't work out, I want you to come back and reapply to work with me because you're going to learn so much through this journey and I'll be able to give you like a better position. I know like you're going to be a better employee in that yeah. kind of thing. So even going into it, I was in that mindset of this is all about learning. This is about improving myself yeah. so that if, you know, if it all goes kaput, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be in a, a better place and ready to take advantage of the next opportunity that would come my way. So 
you know, on, as entrepreneurs, we learn fit, if you don't fail, you're not doing it right. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. know, so, Definitely. you know, like going in, <laughs> knowing failure is, is probably going to happen at some point to yeah. know that you've, you've got a backup plan and a backup plan to your backup plan. And the same with investing or, you know, financial matters to have a safety net, you know, that emergency fund, you know, um, that safe and secure place that in addition to where you're putting out the risk Mm -hmm. that that can be a big, um, uh, motivator or like fear, you know, deterrent. So then you're, you know, you're on a solid foundation and then you can jump from there, but always come back to it. Me and my wife always talk about that. We always leave uh, a certain amount of money on the side in case of emergencies. Because of that, yeah. when we invest in certain uh, vehicles, uh, investment vehicles, we always tell our, ask ourselves, what's the worst that could happen? And because we have that savings on the side, the worst that can happen usually isn't that bad. You know? So, exactly. So that helps yeah. a lot take away the fear. Yep, you got it. <laughs> um, so for the so I had some people DM me um, on, on social media asking different questions. So I separated it into three categories: um, people who are um, practicing or about to practice law, and then it's law students, and then it's college students. Um, okay. So I guess we, uh, if it's okay with you, we could tackle it that way. Sounds good. Awesome. Okay. So this is practicing or about to practice law. Uh, okay. So this person said, I just entered big law and I'm making over 140 K. How should I start taking care of my finances? Um, and this person was talking to me about their student debt as well. They do have a, mm-hmm. a good amount of student debt. Yeah, there. Um, so I, I started my financial journey with a good amount of student debt as well. Um, my husband actually had more than I did and there are different methods out there. People might be familiar with like the, the snowball method or the snow avalanche method. Um, There's actually this really interesting one that one of my friends came up with. He's calling it the snow bank method. Um, And the basic premise of this is that you find a savings vehicle that's going to give you a, a good rate of return, higher than the interest rate that you're paying on the student debt. And you put your money there. And then once that fund, you know, so that's climbing. And meanwhile, your student debt is decreasing. And when they're equal, you take the money that was there and you pay off your student debt. Mm -hmm. Um, And then but then also if you've chosen a vehicle so that we we have a particular vehicle that we use to do this. It's actually a dividend pay high cash value life insurance. Uh, That's pretty structured. What the shorthand that we call it is called bank on yourself. Mm -hmm. And. Um, it, that's a trademarked name. I didn't trademark it, but that's, <laughs> that's my, my favorite name to call it. Yeah. Um, and the cool is when you've taken that money from, from you, you know, you've used the value there off your student loans, mm-hmm. your money still sits there and grows as if you didn't touch it. Mm-hmm. And so you're not destroying compound growth as you go. Mm-hmm. And that then still have that growth. You actually... It might take you longer than using the snow bank or the snow ball or the snow avalanche method to pay off your student debt. But if you look 40 years into the future, you end up with way more, hmm. um, even 20 years in the future, you end up with way more because you never interrupted that compound growth. So that's something to look into. Um, it, I think it's really important to be out of debt, you know, like um, especially student debt that not having that amount come out of your you know out of your bank account every single month is really important but to do it in a way you don't have to do it the fastest way Mm -hmm. you have to do it the most beneficial way for you yeah and to figure out a strategy maybe it's that snow bank strategy that i used maybe it's a different but figuring out a way to make it happen you feel comfortable with and that you're you're excited about and then get it done you know Mm -hmm. um because then you're going to have that money free and available to do something else with in, in the future. Yeah. Would you recommend that same method for someone coming out of law school with a job paying a lot less? Actually, yes. Um, I have a, a friend that, not a, a law school, but I uh, went to art school. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you can imagine art school is pretty expensive, but yeah. the salary of someone out after law, <laughs> or after art school is not very big. And he's, he's doing that method too. And he has six figures of student debt. And if he had just paid, um, 
so he has it kind of deferred because his yes. salary is so small. He he would never pay it off in his lifetime. Like yeah. uh, it would be over a hundred years before it was all paid off. Wow. But with the using the snow bank strategy, he's going to be able to pay it off before he retires, wow. um, even with the low salary that he has. So would you recommend someone um, begin their investing journey? Um, immediately or should they wait until after they pay off their student loans or how would you suggest i get that question a lot where it's like they say they have certain amounts of debt whether it's credit card or student loans and they see all in their friends investing and they just feel like they're kind of left behind and they don't know what to do yeah i i would say a hundred percent start your savings strategy um in and not like coupon clipping but like mm -hmm. setting money aside creating that emergency fund before yeah. you pay off your debt because the worst thing, the worst thing that could happen is you have some emergency come up and you have to go further into debt. Yeah. So if you get a nice save set aside, um, for people they might feel like a different amounts. So maybe it's three months of expenses. Maybe it's a year of expenses. You know, it's it's up to you. Um, mm -hmm. Have that set aside and then aggressively attacking debt um, can be can be really helpful because then you know you're not going to have to go back into debt. And then in terms of investing. Think about your risk tolerance. Um, I'm I'm actually because my risk comes in my entrepreneurial life. I'm actually really safe about my money, and I don't like yeah. to risk it, um, in, in a huge degree. And so I actually found um, a, some strategies that can help me with with that safety and security. The the bank on yourself method um, is what I like to use. And I started doing that though before I'd paid off my student debt, but then I got paid off in two and a half years after wow. starting that strategy and uh, both my and my debt half yeah. years and it helped that our business was also growing um yeah. doing some really cool too but we you know we did it and that but finding that uh send that strategy can be really helpful nice yeah i agree um one question i do get um from mostly uh i think it's um not only law students, but I think anyone kind of graduating with a potential high income. And I think I think I know your answer to this question, but uh, I usually get, should I, can I buy a flashy new car when I graduate or a flashy new apartment? What would you recommend? <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm actually going to uh, quote from the, or like I'm pulling from an influence. It's called youneedabudget.com. It's an app called mm -hmm. You Need a Budget. This guy, Jesse Meek, um, uh, created it or Meacham. And he, um, he is a big proponent on priorities. So mm -hmm. if your priority is to have a nice, big, flashy car, and you need that to be accepted in the circles of potential clients you're looking for, or that kind of thing, yeah. then do it, you yeah. know, but if that's not your priority, if your priority is getting out of debt, if your priority is growing your practice, you know, not with those, you know, flashy people, but people maybe, I, I mean, i um, I don't want to sound like, uh, uh, like I'm, I'm like negative about like having a bit, you know, yeah. hanging out with people that drive BMWs or yeah. whatever, but like maybe you want to, you know, serve or more genuine or, you know, something like that. Yeah. And don't, you know, don't need the flashy cars in order to show who they really are. Or, you yeah. Know, like that. Maybe, maybe then that's your priority. Like you, maybe your priority is to, um, you know, have, that passive income and that financial freedom as soon as you can yeah. like figure out your priority and then with it. Yeah. And so I, and this might surprise you, but if that's your priority to have a flashy car, then go for it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also, I guess your passion too, right? If it's your passion and that's the only thing you spend money on in your home cooking every day, then you can make it work into your budget. One thing I also found yeah. that I don't hear a lot is uh, talking to your accountant. Because if you're able to mix your passion with your business, with your side hustle, your side business, a lot of things can be a tax write-off. And although you won't get all yep. of it back, um, you, you, it's kind of surprising what you would get back from your taxes uh, if you just talk to your accountant and try to mixing in your personal life with your business. Obviously, to not everything you could do that with, but with certain things, mm -hmm. like uh, even with this podcast, uh, a lot of the stuff I purchased for the podcast, um, I put under my real estate uh, LLC because uh, it was in furtherance of me advertising my journey with real estate. Uh, and my accountant said, yeah. that's perfectly fine. It's legal. It's in this code and let's do it. So talking to your accountant is, I think, one of the most important things to do as well. Absolutely. For sure. 
Uh, what is your opinion regarding 401ks, good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm not, I'm kind of not, I'm telling you my opinions, but I'm, I'm giving you where I, you know, how I've been informed by these opinions. So yeah. Ted Benna was the guy that found that part of the revenue code and, you know, really was a big proponent of the 401k back in the, you know, 79, 8, 1980s. And um, he now, swears against it. Yeah. He is, yeah. you know, <laughs> most people don't know that. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> and in fact, when you ask what he's doing with his money, guess, do you know where he's putting it now? No. Into whole life insurance oh, using yeah. the, that strategy with the high cash value dividend paying that huh. bank on yourself idea that I was talking about before. Yeah. Uh, that's what he's doing now. And I tell people too, you know, the 401k is, is a, a, you know, a 30 something. It's not even old and retire yet yeah. is that really the retirement strategy you yeah. want to be using whereas life is hundreds of years old and there are companies that have been profitable and pay dividends for over 100 years does that sound like a better place to be saving for that crucial time in your life you know in retirement and then there's all kinds of other advantages you know uh, tax wise and you know not the the penalty if you're younger than 59 and a half and you're early and you want to access your money, not the yeah. required minimum distributions when you're 70 and a half, um, mm -hmm. all those kind of things kind of give the 401k advantage when compared with some other strategies that people might use. Do you recommend any books or articles of regarding that that method of going about it with the, the whole life insurance? Yeah. So there's a, a bankonyourself.com and mm -hmm. the lady who you know started that her name is Pamela Yellen she wrote a really great book called the bank on yourself revolution um the there are other people that talk about the same concept and call it different things the reason i really like pamela's work is that um she uh she actually trains people and gives them the accountability to make sure they're setting these up right for people mm -hmm. um there a lot of other people do do this and um, there it's more like a virus where it's been mutated and changed over time and there's yeah. not that you know somebody making sure they're doing it the right way and so I actually full disclosure I'm actually a bank and yourself authorized advisor mm -hmm. I've been trained by Pamela and I set these up for people but only because I started mine um, when I was in my 20s mm -hmm. and I, that's what I used to pay off my student debt. I used it for my business and it really helped me then to the point where we sold our coffee shop. Um, and I couldn't have done that if I didn't have this strategy in my back pocket, you know, yeah. being that foundation for me. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the, that's you can learn more from her or if you want to learn more about it, you could listen to our podcast, Grandma's Wealth Wisdom, or just reach out to me and I've got a bunch of articles and things yeah. I could share um, and show you how it could work for you. Because really, like, you can learn just like in law, you learn all these like theories and practices, but yeah. until you like see a case study or you, you know, do it, do it for yourself, it's hard to like really get it. So yeah. we actually set up, set the set up bank on yourself type policy people at no charge oh, wow. um, and show them like show them how the strategy could work for them and we just we do all that work for free with no obligation to buy it either wow. so that's super interesting I never that just goes to show that like you never know everything you know like no matter how much financial knowledge you have you never know everything because I've, I've never heard of that but um that makes a lot of sense and I definitely want to yeah. learn more about that yeah the, there's a you might have heard of bank owned life insurance it's called bully for short or yeah. corporate owned life insurance coley the, they're doing this you know all the time huh. um there's ton you know there's presidents that have had these types of policies congressmen and women but no one talks about it well and they're right. private contracts between you and the insurance company so like it doesn't show up on tax return it doesn't hmm. You know, it's not it's um protected. So if you're sued, they can't have access to the money that's there. Things like that. I, I, you know, yeah. attorneys get this. So that's why I'm talking yeah. like this. Um. So, but because it's kind of hidden, then people just don't talk about it as much. Definitely. And that's one of the things I'm trying to change because I it's been so valuable for me. People need to be talking about it more, in yeah. my opinion. No, definitely. <laughs> uh, to add what you said, uh, everyone should definitely check 
what you set out for sure because i know i'm going to today like immediately <laughs> um but uh also yeah like you said t- uh, talk to your financial advisor and talk to your accountant i think a lot of people also don't know about um something that was common at some point but kind of lost its popularity um but i read about it through the bigger pockets um books uh, about taxes and stuff like that um like self-directed iras for for investing if you want to invest in real estate that might be a method people could take um but there's so many different ways where um to um, save your money sometimes people should kind of um, second guess or second or question their decision to, um, go full in on their 401ks. Um, especially like right. you said, it's kind of a very, uh, I want to say archaic kind of method, uh, just cause when it was created, like, you know, it wasn't created to be used for ever, you know? Um, right. but definitely, um, the next section is college students, unless you have okay. something else to add to the last section. I mean, I could talk about that forever, but I'd, I would just say if people want to talk about it, you know, you can you can go out on Google and find everything that you would want to know about that strategy that I just shared. There's so many people talking about it, pros and cons, but the best way to find out if it's going to work for you is to talk to someone like me who know, knows how yeah. to set these up and could show you how it works through you, and then you'll be able to make the best decision. So I know you've talked about that on the podcast before about yeah. having a mentor, you know, that, yeah. and rather than going to Google. Yeah. And so, like, I actually th- feel at, in some ways I'm more of a financial coach. I love to show people what the possibilities are. And, um, and we actually, when we, if we do set up a bank on yourself policy for people, we're, we're taking a 50 to 70% commission cut than uh, compared with other typical life insurance uh, salespeople or yeah. life insurance agents. And that, that if that it should tell you anything, it should tell you, I do this because I really want to help people, not yeah. because I want to make money. Yeah. Um, and if I really was wanting to make money, I probably would have gone to law school like I had planned to originally. <laughs> 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 that's really noble though that you're that you're doing that i like that a lot i have um sometimes people dm me and then ask me to meet uh, with them for coffee and talk about things and i'll get there and i'll just uh, lay out all this information i'll tell them what books to read i'll tell them what website to go to i'll tell them who to talk to and then they'll be like okay but what's in it for you and uh and usually it's just like i just say it look like i just really kind of want to make an impact on the world i like I, you don't know when you're gonna go you really don't. Yep. And the fact exactly. that, and when you go, I really, I'm a big proponent of leaving something behind. And the only real thing of value you can leave behind besides real estate <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is really just your impact on people. And the fact that you're yep. helping people, I mean, um, you, like you may be used to what you're doing by now, but from a third party perspective, being able to wipe out your student debt, uh, using that method. I mean, if I could wipe out my student debt quickly, uh, man, like that would change my life. I wouldn't have, you know, the stress people go through thinking about their student debt, even when they're not paying it off yet. Like even when you're in school, it's, mm-hmm. it, it could be crippling at times. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, and if anything, then when you've experienced that, you're going to want to pay it forward. And that's yeah. really been my case, um, that I, you know, just that whole idea, like I, I've always wanted to help you know, change the world, make it a better place for my generation, but also for future generations. And if I can do that at the same time as, um, you know, help, like helping people reach that freedom yeah. that, you know, comes from not ha- being in debt and having that emergency fund and all those kind of things, then let's, let's make it happen. Yeah. It's funny too, because like, I feel like reaching financial freedom or reaching financial health in a lot of ways it's going to sound like a stretch, but I really believe it is that it could really make the world a better place. Um, no, a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, so there, um, I was reading an intro letter that Bernie Sanders wrote, not to get political, it's but <laughs> he wrote it. And yeah. <laughs> he was, he was saying that even like owning your own home or having a solid yeah. ho- like home base, like to live in is a a perfect foundation. And if you don't have that, you're not able to dream. You're not able to live up to your full potential. He said it so much more eloquently than I'm saying it. But you're right. But like, so with, within, you know, real estate, like you're in some way, you're providing that place for people to launch their dreams from, to, to, to sleep well at night. So then they're not, you know, cranky the next day and they do a good job at work or they're nice to their kids or, you know, whatever it is. And if you can do it for yourself and then you can provide that for other people, that, that, that does change the world, even if it changes the world for one person. Yeah. Uh, So one issue in the legal community is that so many people are unhappy with their jobs. And although there could be a lot of factors for that, I think being forced to do anything, you do it a little less happy. 
Um, yeah. So if you're able to to be able to have um, a savings plan in case you get fired or or enough passive income to be able to, if you want to, you could live just through your, your passive income. You treat life a little bit differently. You treat people a little bit nicer. You work a little bit harder. Your clients are a little bit more like family to you because you're not just looking at them as a dollar sign. So with me, um, uh, I get asked like, oh, like, what do you do with your passive income? And um, I'm in the place now where I'm not starving. I'm not, um, I know I'm not um, always finding a way to make money. I'm, I'm content with my, I'm very happy. Uh, so the money I make for my real estate, I give to my parents to support them through retirement. And um, in reality, it, it makes me feel like, like I'm, ma- I'm making a difference, you know? And yeah, so being yeah. able to do that, you know, you can't do that without financial health. So I always like, if you want to make your life better, there's a lot of ways to do that. And there's a lot of things to look at, but one way is improving your financial health. I feel like. Yeah, for sure. Okay. We should talk about yeah, college. Okay. Now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay. So which one is which is the most important? I feel like here. Uh, okay. Should I use all of my savings to avoid taking out student loans or should I build my savings up and kind of take loans out? Yeah, if you can get deferred loans where they're not accumulating interest while you're in school and then whatever savings you have is accumulating interest while you're in school and then, you know, I think you've got like a six month delay from when you graduate while it's still not going to be gaining interest. If you Mm -hmm. can do that, you like don't use your savings take those loans but then pay them off you know with before they start accumulating interest if you can um that's a a great strategy and in fact i've I've helped people do that you know same thing for maybe for their kids rather than Mm -hmm. you know like the kids doing that uh or the the college student doing that um but at the same time like i worked throughout college um i had a part-time job it helped me learn a lot about um you know the the how to work and how to have a supervisor, you know, all those kinds of things and help make sure I didn't take out enough loans. And I also didn't have to, you know, blow all of my savings, although I think I actually did, <laughs> you know, just because, you know, I was a young college student too, you know. Yeah. But like there are all kinds of strategies for how to pay for college without maxing out your loans, without mm-hmm. using all of your savings. Explore them, you know, be willing to, you know, live with roommates or, you know, not, not be on the campus meal plan and make your own food or, you know, like, yeah. um, all the different things Buy used textbooks or not even textbooks at all. Use ele- electronics or, yeah. you know, I don't, it's been so long since I've been in school, it, even though it hasn't been that long, I'm sure things have changed so much. It's honestly like, like the school system is so <laughs> archaic at this point. It's literally the same thing. Like also okay. <laughs> if you know people a grade above you, right. Ask them for their textbooks. A lot of people, you know, will just give it to you for free. Right. And I did, if I didn't know someone I could give my textbooks to, I sold them online. Yeah. Uh, and then I'd use that money to buy the next textbooks that I needed. So. Exactly. Um, yeah. So for college students um, applying to law school, um, do you recommend, do you, should they wait a year before going to law school and save up money to pay their tuition or help make a dent in the tuition so that they avoid taking out student loans? Uh, or should they, do you recommend, if it's graduate school too, do you recommend they just kind of just go in and just get the whole process started. And I asked that specifically because in law school, it's almost impossible to keep a part-time job or a full-time job while in law school right. unless you go part-time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And even the, um, the jobs you can do are usually uh, in school. So you'll work at the library or something like that. But usually it's only like five hours a week or something. So what would you recommend? Yeah. I, again, you have to figure out what's best for you. Um, there's, I don't think there's a cookie cutter answer here. Um, and depending on what your savings is, depending on how, what the cost of the of going is, uh, depending on what you think you're going to be doing afterwards. You know, mm-hmm. if you're going to uh, go into more the nonprofit sector or the for profit sector, you might have different salaries that way. If you're going to start your own law practice, you might want to be thinking through like what what's the plan afterward. And am I am I going to want to have that debt or am I going to want to uh, not have that debt and then um, make the decision of do I need to wait one year? Do I need to wait five years? Do I need, you know, like and there can be all kinds of other situations. Like I always said, so I, I totally planned to go to law school um, after I graduated undergrad, but I wanted to uh, wait for a little while, um, really make sure that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't know what focus I wanted to do. I went to a liberal arts school because mm-hmm. I love lots of different things. And um, so I, I wanted to like, know what, well, why would I really go to law school besides just because 
I want to, you know, yeah. like, what am I going to do afterward? Yeah. And it turned out because I waited that amount of time, I always said I would go back when I had my first kid because I'd have good childcare at the university yeah. <laughs> and, cause, you know, and it would be inexpensive childcare. Yeah. And, um, but now that I've had my first kid, I'm having a really great time doing this financial professional stuff. And I've had a really awesome entrepreneurial journey, uh, over the years too. And like, I'm, I'm really thankful that I didn't just jump into it right away. And that's what worked best for me. I still might go at some point. Yeah. I, I love, you know, uh, thinking critically and analyzing situations, but I also don't know, like, how would that actually benefit me? Do I really want to be like exactly. doing estate planning or, you know, something <laughs> like that? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I, 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 that's kind of an interesting take on it, obviously, because I hopefully like your listeners, if they're it, going into law school, if they're already in law school, they know those kind of things or they're okay with not knowing those kind of things. Yeah. Um, but for me as a planner, I wanted to know those things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> we spoke also a little bit about how uh, compound growth and different methods could turn a little bit of money into a lot of money. Uh, so what are a couple ways that um, people could save money daily without really thinking about it too much? Yeah, there's some you know, there's always some an app out there for that, you know, that you can have, you know, where you if you like use a particular card that it rounds up to the nearest dollar and mm-hmm. tr- transfers that money somewhere. Um, but I think I mean, that's a, a lot to like keep track of, you know, and and that kind of thing. What I love to think through is when you get your paycheck or when you get, you know, the loan disbursement or whatever it is, you know, if they're in law school or um, it, whatever they have in their savings you know, what if you like the day you get that the next day, a a lump sum is taken out Mm -hmm. and put somewhere and then you don't have to think about it. And it just happens auto auto magically, you know? Um, and then, um, it, you know, it's still there if you need access to it. Um, it's not, you know, hidden away and something that you can't touch till you're 60, you know? Um, and, but it's also like automatic and maybe it starts with 20 bucks. Maybe it starts with 10% of your income. Maybe it starts with half if, you know, you know you're being really aggressive with your lifestyle. Um, it, it can be any amount, but making that happen, you know, for me, that happens on the first of the month every month. Yeah. I, I have a set amount that leaves my bank account and I watch it, you know, like I see what's there. It's actually I'm planning to use it to purchase a home pretty soon. Um, and I, I have a huge down payment because I did that. And I'm like, and it's also been there for me mm-hmm. uh, for, for a long time too. I've used it for other things and then I refuel it as I can as well. So, um, yeah, with like you, the key thing is to not much effort. And yeah. if it's daily, that's still going to be effort. Yeah, so if up. you make it, I think monthly, that makes a little more sense yeah. or twice a month if you get paid twice a month, whatever yeah. it is. That's true. I remember I had a friend uh, during college asked me, Chris, how could I save money? And I go, well, what's your day look like? He's like, I usually go, you know, go to lunch at Chipotle, but I cook at home to save money. And I was like, don't get guac. Don't get guacamole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Each day, each day taking away, you know, two dollars, three dollars, that adds up. And then, like you said, put it in in somewhere where you could access it, but it's also far away enough where it's not an easy little, oh, I'll spend it on this or that. But I agree. Tell me more about your podcast. Yeah. Well, actually, I should say, so people always use the whole don't buy the latte or, you know, that kind of thing every day to save money as a former coffee shop owner and a coffee (laughs) snob. Like it's your priorities. If guac or latte is your priority, then Then figure out some other way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like if you prefer guac, then instead of going to the movies, go to, this is what I do. I go to a thrift shop that sells DVDs and I buy a $3 DVD. So me and my wife watch a movie together and we save $20. But I don't cheap up on comics. I love comic books. If if something comes out and I need to to read it, I I go ahead and buy it. Yeah, we, my husband, huge comic book fan. So all those Marvel movies, he loves to go see yeah. and we'll go see it but we won't get the popcorn and the exactly, drink that yeah. are like more than the cost of the movie you yeah know? So, and a lot of movies yeah. uh, like there's this myth out there where you can't bring your own snacks a lot of movie oh, theaters no. actually Always allow that yeah, yeah like bring your own snacks are you kidding me yeah. <laughs> I'll have, like when... a bag of carrots <laughs> that's what i did i i uh i bring green green beans sometimes just like a healthy alternative although i'm that yeah. weirdo that's eating green beans while watching a movie um no i I carrots. Yeah, the baby Definitely. carrots. So yeah, so tell me more about your podcast. I, by the way, I love it. I'm a big fan. So tell the Thank viewers you. a little bit about it. 
Yeah, so it's called Grandma's Wealth Wisdom, and my husband and I are the ones that talk on there, and we have a lot of fun with it. Um, right now, episodes are coming out every other week because we're our business is doing so well. It's been hard to keep up with making episodes all the time. Um, we we it's been fun though putting together educational resources and talking about things. We have a uh, three episodes all about the fire movement. Um, what to kind. Of, but, you know, sort of setting up what is the fire movement and then the threats, uh, we call them fire extinguishers, the things that can, you know, ex- extinguish your hopes of financial independence or to retire early. And then what we think is the perfect match. And we go really in depth into mm-hmm. the bank on yourself strategy that we use and how that's getting us toward financial independence or and the option to retire early. Mm-hmm. Um, so we talk about that. We, and then we're, we're really into social justice. So lately we've been doing uh, some episodes about like the idea of home, about the idea of like disability Mm -hmm. of, you know, having hope for the future, um, and digging, digging into some of those things that, you know, really we, we live in a country that, you know, everyone wants the American dream. It's the land of opportunity, but so many people are being left out of that. Um, whether because of their immigration status, the color of their skin, you know, whatever the case might be, but that makes me mad. And so we've been talking about that a lot recently and how to, how do we reclaim the American dream, but not the white picket fence and 2.5 kids in a house in the suburbs, but the American dream in the way of like, the independence and the freedom that, you know, that we've been promised, like we've been told, you know, is our inalienable right, you know? Um, And so like, what does that look like for people that have been left out of that option for generations of America, you know? And so I I really want to keep talking more about that because I think grandma and her perspective, that's what she really cares about. You know, when we're in our eighties and nineties, we're not going to be thinking about the fancy car. We're not going to be, Oh, I mean, hopefully (laughs) we're going to think about our families (laughs) and the impact that we've made for the less fortunate and those kind of things. And so it's really what we try to get to in the podcast is what's really the core of the matter and how do we stand on those foundations and those values. Yeah. It's a great tool to use. Hopefully you kind of got that as you're listening. I know I did. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. And like, (laughs) that's huge. Um, But yeah, uh, thank you for also taking that journey yourself. I know a lot of times it could be hard. I know from my experience, it's so hard to even just set up a podcast, let alone committing to, to trying to help out in any way you can. Yeah, we we did hire a producer to help us with that because I was just spending so much time editing yeah. podcasts myself and I want to spend time with my son. You know, that's part of what financial independence means for me yeah. is that my time isn't editing podcasts. It's, you know, yeah. putting him down for a nap or feeding him or, you know, whatever it is. And so um, that that's, you know, that's the, my priority. And I was willing to spend the money to get someone else to do that for me so that I could you know, that's really my biggest luxury right now is being able to be with him. Yeah. You can never buy back time. Exactly. All right. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for, for talking with me today. I was so excited when you answered, I went to your bio, I went to your podcast. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks. This has been really fun. And, um, I, I, I'm been listening to your podcast too. I look forward to listening. Maybe I will go back to and go to law school (laughs) after listening to some more of your episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who knows? Right. (laughs) Um, yep. But yeah, uh, how could people get in contact with you if they want to ask you more questions? Yeah, so obviously there's grandmaswealthwisdom.com and you can request a meeting right there. Uh, you could also look me up on Instagram um, or um, find me on Facebook. I'm, don't, I'm not really on Facebook, more <laughs> like Instagram. <laughs> um, <laughs> me too. And, I'm on yeah. Facebook, but I, I never right. go on it. <laughs> yeah. So Instagram or just go through the website, you'll see like a little request a meeting button and you can schedule a 20 minute call just to ask questions, say, hey, you said this, but you know, what about that? I I love people, you know, both challenging my perspective and also seeking to learn a little bit more. So I'd love to to talk with people. Sounds great. Uh, And hopefully I can talk to you again soon. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you again. Have an amazing day, and I hope to have you on at some point later. For sure, anytime. Hello, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. If you liked it, go to my iTunes podcast and leave it five stars and a good review, or go to SoundCloud or Google Play or YouTube. That's as much as I can say. Promise me you'll be there.
Broken glass, the weight of rain and even skies, choices we make.